usually, I guess these things start with a history of the organisation itself. And um, this organisation has a, a very particular um, history because uh, it's here in Germany. It's a union based here in Germany. So when unions really started to take off and become a force in society in the early 1900s, they also had a huge impact here in Germany. Unfortunately, the rise of the National Socialists, the Nazis, meant that um, the union tradition was effectively wiped out uh, as the Nazis grew to power and subsequently never really recovered, particularly because Germany was split into the two, into two, into the east and the west. And um, after this split, uh, yeah, the union tradition, as we know it, this kind of base unionism, this union, unionism that comes from the workers, comes from the working class, didn't really take off again, probably because of the political situation at the time, because um, most kind of class tension was expressed it was expressed more in um, so communist groups, authoritarian communist groups, and uh, as the decades went on, um, autonomous networks. Um, yeah, it, that's the way class tension was expressed, rather than in other countries where you see even throughout the 20th century this unionism existed and this tradition stayed strong. So up until you know the 90s, the FAO as this organisation that, that we are now part of was very small and continues to be small, we have to be honest. It's not the, a huge organisation by any means in comparison to other unions across the world of the same type. But before the Nazis came to power, you know, it was hundreds of thousands of members and was, uh, you know, had a huge amount of influence over society. So, we're a small group, let's say that. We're a small organisation. That's our history. You know, in, in the 90s, we kind of, uh, I suppose, we staggered along. We tried to keep in existence, and then the last 10 years, we've seen an upturn again. And... Uh, I guess that's something that you see across the world at the minute, it is a kind of renewed interest in this type of politics, this type of resistance to, uh, to the way society is organised today. So that's, that's you know, uh, there's, there's lots of reasons obviously for all of this that I won't go into now. I mean, why we wanted to gather people today or why we're here to talk today is to talk about why... You know, even with all this, um, even though we're a small group, even though it seems like unionism or anarcho syndicalism isn't really a good option these days, it seems like, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not the first, um, or it's not the, 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 the biggest uh, group um, showing resistance to, to capitalism or whatever but we want to talk about why we think it is why we think it is a good idea to join the union why we think the work we do is important and that's what I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about that for a bit I'm just going to talk shortly I'm not going to bore you all to death but then Johnny is going to talk and he will speak about his, um, his experiences, his story here working in Germany and how he was fired by his boss and how he won his job back using uh, the tactics and the ideas of Anarchist syndicalism and the FAO here. So, um, so we want to talk, so why, why join the union? Why, is there, why do we think there's strength in the union? A lot of people talk about it there being strength in the union, you know. I mean, on a very basic level, of course, when people come together and... Uh, uh, when they come together and, and stick together, they, they're much more powerful. That's the first obvious fact, right? But we want to talk about this uh, particular type of way of coming together. We don't just mean some, you know, we randomly come together with some... You know, without any thought, there's a very um, developed organisational idea behind what we're doing. 
And um, yeah, so why are we here? Why, you know, why are we using this model when it seems so outdated? It does seem outdated. It seems like a historical thing that people did in the past. You joined the union in the past. Why would you join one now? When people think about unions now, they probably think of Verdi, the big union here in Germany, or the DEB, or wherever they're coming from. And wherever you're coming from in Europe, these big bureaucratic unions, and you go to your job and you're forced to pay them money, and you never see the guy, you never see anything from them, you never hear about them, they're never representative in the workplace. So why would you, why would you join a union now? Why, why do we think there's strength in the union? Well, I think that union strength comes from this solidarity, this coming together of people. So an internal solidarity, when you come to the fair here and you meet all the other people, and people stick together because people have a shared experience of what they've of what you're going through in your workplace. And we have an external solidarity as well. We've got all the people we are connected to and network to, not just here in Germany, but also across the world as part of the International Workers Association. So that's one point. There's definitely the solidarity, the real solidarity that people can feel when they come in the door and when they have a problem at work or when they have any sort of problem. There's people here to work together on that problem. The second thing that we have is an infrastructure. We've got this office where we can meet outside of the workplace. Um, we've got money. We've got lawyers, we've got access to all these things that as a single worker in your workplace, you don't have access to, you know. Most people can't afford to go to a lawyer or don't know the right lawyer to go to. So you go to the lawyer and he says, yeah, whatever. He's not interested in your case because generally, unless he's going to make a lot of money out of it, he's not interested. And the cases that we come across in everyday life, it's in, uh, in the workplace, generally are small things. But they're the type of things that the boss uses to bully us. And they bully us a lot. As a single person, we don't have access to these type of things, the infrastructure. So that's another point. So we've got solidarity and we've got our infrastructure. We've got experience. We've got people here who've been active in the union for, you know, 20, 30 years. You know, who are approaching retirement and are still active here. Now... That experience is invaluable because they've seen everything that we've gone through or that, that we're going through now. They've seen it. It's not like um, the type of things that happen in the workplace are, are all new just to our generation. They've been going on for a very long time. So these older people that we have here, and not just the older people, you know, the people who've been involved in struggles, they have a very detailed experience of what to do and they know exactly where to go and they know when to put pressure on and they know when to take pressure off and um, when we come here and when um, say if somebody comes here with, uh, with, a, with a problem that whole wealth of experience is there to advise them so that's a very important point I think it's very good um, and the last, the last point I'll touch on in terms of where I think union strength comes from is definitely is very particular to this union, and that is self-organisation. And by self-organisation, I mean that um, well, first of all, there's no uh, there's no leaders here in the fair, or no bosses. Let's say there are leaders, of course. There's people who are more dynamic and open, and they. You know, they lead perhaps by example, but bosses, there's no bosses. There's nobody who has more say than another person. Everybody has an equal say. That's very important. It's one of the big problems with these larger unions, you know, when you go to them. There's, you know, when you go to these unions, there's a paid, um, there's a paid management. And that's their job. They run the union. And there's nobody here running the union, we run it ourselves. There's no paid officials. There's nobody with a stake in keeping their job. I mean, on a theoretical level, that means that there's nobody, who's, there's nobody whose job it is here to mediate. To mediate between 
the bosses and the workers. We are uh, we we uh, organize by ourselves, and the person who who okay, the person who has the problem, they're the ones who are making the decisions about their life or the, or how they're going to deal with the problem. It's not like somebody comes in here with a problem and there's somebody who and there's they sit in front of somebody else who gets a big fat wage check at the end of the month and he says, okay, do this, do that, and uh, you can go on out. And we won't ever hear from you again. People come in here, we discuss it together. The person who uh, is affected by the problem, you know, leads, leads the struggle, so to speak, because it's their problem. And... Um, you know, they're the only ones who who understand the complexity of the issue, and understand all the different uh, kind of tensions that play in the workplace. And I think that is a real strength. I think it's a real strength that people come in here and learn that. Um, I mean, it's a set of skills, so to speak, to be able to self-organize, to be able to work with other people and make decisions. Uh, all together in a horizontal way without somebody at the top or a board of people deciding what's going to happen for us we make all the decisions together and I think that's a real strength because then you start to see a much more um, you see much more complex decisions being made and decisions that are um, much more flexible and uh, much more representative of the membership as a whole so that for me is very important. So there's solidarity, there's the infrastructure we have, the experience, and uh, our commitment to, to, to uh, self-organisation. Hello. <clears throat> so these, and uh, I'll just say one last thing about self-organisation is these type of skills. You know, when you come in here, I and mean, it is a, it is a different thing sit amongst people and make a decision together and not have somebody telling you what to do. That's a very different thing. That It doesn't normally happen. And it is the type of thing that spreads to other aspects of life and spreads to other social struggles that maybe are outside the workplace, like your um, ten, like a tenants association or, you know, um, uh, social struggles. Uh, well, give me another example. <laughs> <laughs> Um, students. students, university, do you, um, and I guess it's important to say that we have a lot of students as memberships here in, uh, who have membership in the fair, and we also have people, of course, who are not employed. That's very important. We don't make a separation between people who are unemployed and people who are employed. Of course not. We're all part of the, essentially, part of the working class, you know. So I guess there, uh, that's where I see union strength. There are my big points on union strength and why, I, well, why I'm a member, you know. And, uh, you know, I guess then the next thing is why do we need this strength? What's going on at the minute? Well, obviously, I don't think anybody's blind to the fact that we're in a huge crisis. We have been for four years. Germany likes to present itself like it hasn't been touched by the by the crisis, but in fact Germany has the most advanced system of exploiting its workers probably in Europe, and it's something it's trying to push to other countries as a solution to their crisis, and it is a very, very rough system that's in place here, and I mean, we won't go into it in too much detail, but if anyone has experience with hard sphere, with mini jobs with uh, freelancing these are all exactly you know they suit capitalism they suit the bosses to have people working in these type of conditions these precarious conditions your mini job you're getting 400 euro a month you know or you're being forced into freelance nobody will give you a job they're saying I want everything on retina so I don't have to pay your social or your uh, cranking cast or your health insurance so Germany is very good at doing that. It's very good at, you know, it presents itself as having a very high rate of employment and uh, a very high rate of production. But where is it coming from? It's coming from this whole class of people, you know. Well, it's coming from this whole strata of people who are, 
who are essentially would be unemployed if it wasn't for these measures that Germany has taken to kind of force them into some sort of employment. Anyway, even if we're not talking about Germany, we're talking about the world in general, and everybody is fucked. You know, everybody is looking into the abyss of going, oh my God, am I going to have a job next month? Am I going to have to emigrate somewhere else? You know, a lot of us are here because we have emigrated from other countries. You know, I come from Ireland. I came here four years ago. There was no work left. And I came here and I thought, okay, maybe it would be better here. It wasn't. And it's still the same thing. It's still the same thing at the workplace where there's people who are looking, looking over their shoulder. The workers are all scared. Um, we're being squeezed to the last drop. You know, you're doing loads of unpaid overtime. You're accepting whatever crap the boss throws at you because you're afraid that you're going to lose your job. You're afraid that what happens if next month I, I lose my job and then what happens with my kids or my partner or my, uh, my plans for the next two months. It's, very, it's a common experience we all share. And it's one that for a lot of people we don't know the response. How do we respond to this type of to this type of life that we have in front of us? We don't have a choice, uh, you know. And my choice was to move away somewhere else, and it's still the same thing. And that's why I came uh, across the foul, and I came, you know, I had uh, been member of a union in Ireland before. It was what I described earlier on, this big traditional mainstream union, you never saw the guy, he never came, I didn't know who he was, I was paying 10 euro a month to these people, not 10, 10 euro a week I was paying to them, I didn't even know where their office was, I didn't have their phone number, nothing, but I was giving them 10 euro a week to do what, I don't know. So I came across the fair one, the f and uh, it's... <laughs> It's a fighting union. It means that, uh, you know, we, we're going to fight these things because not only uh, do we have these kind of uh, the, the, the principles of a strong union, of a strong working class, but we are also committed to social transformation. We don't want to accept the way the world is being organised at the minute. We want to change it for the better. And using these kind of principles and the ideas that we have, we slowly start to build up some sort of movement. And I think it's very important. I think what's happening now at the minute is uh, not only are we all very scared and everyone's gone, what's going to happen next? But all the things that the working class and the working class movement, the unions from the early 1900s, the, the labour movement, that maybe wasn't associated necessarily with unions, but the workplace struggle over the past hundred years, all the things that they've won, the eight-hour working day, the health care, the uh, um, child mind, and all the, all, all the benefits that we've won through struggle, let's not forget, it wasn't like the bosses turned around in the early 1900s and said, do you know what was a good idea, maybe you should only work eight hours a day. That would be good, wouldn't it? Wouldn't everybody be happy? They didn't. Of course they didn't. We had to fight. People lost their lives. But the working class won these things. And won these things by being organised and sticking together. And now, these very things that we've won are being stripped away. And being slowly attacked and just wiped off the agenda. And suddenly, they're not our rights anymore. We're not entitled to them. They're like luxurious things. You know, they belong to a different era. Now we're expected to be uh, more flexible, to um, to uh, rise to the demands of like this new type of capitalism with startups and you know small like these uh, internet companies and things like that. Where suddenly they're going, well, you know, you should um, you should forget about all those things. You know, you should forget about your eight-hour working day and your holiday pay and your benefits. So that's why I think it's very important to even not join, perhaps not join this union, perhaps uh, 
you don't see it as a, as some sort of uh, answer to to what's going on. But um, I think it's important to begin again this type of struggle in the workplace of workers coming together and standing together and fighting and winning. And we are we are winning slowly. We're beginning to win. Very small things. We start out small and we're not many members, but every time we go into something, um, we come out better for it. And uh, that's to do with how the union is organised. It's to do with us being very flexible. This thing again of everyone making the decisions. And uh, yeah, I, um, I think that the people here are very committed to what... Um, to what they say. They're very committed to this idea. Um, if people want to know more about how it's organised, how it looks actually like what happens when you come to a meeting, when the meetings are, how much you have to pay, all that kind of stuff. Um, is it a national organisation? It is a national organisation. We're not just here in Berlin, we're all over Germany. Things like that. Um, I guess we can talk afterwards or there'll be questions at the end. I didn't want to bore everybody with those type of things like, oh, there's a meeting on Wednesdays and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, so I'll pass you over to Johnny. And um... Um, I'm here um, because I want to tell you about one or two workplace struggles that I've been through. I haven't really decided yet. It uh, depends how long this first story will take. Um, I have um, a history of struggles in Sweden, when I'm, where I'm from, and I also have been through workplace struggles here in Berlin. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to start with the Berlin one. What a cliffhanger! Uh, I moved here uh, summer, uh, the summer of 2010, and uh, I'm a teacher. So I started to I started to work at a school here, which is an international school in Zelmerstov. Uh, it's a Swedish school. Um, so I came here in August 2010, and I quickly realized that this workplace was not a very well functioning one one from a worker's perspective. Um, we were working um, sometimes weekends for free and we had one hour on Fridays that we didn't get paid on, we didn't have any contracts, we didn't have any staff room, we didn't have any rest restroom, no, no, <laughs> no, uh, we, we had restrooms, but we didn't have any place to have our breaks, yeah. <laughs> right, right. a bit of difference. <laughs> um, yeah, and we are also we worked for free on the school trip, which was four days, and I realized that okay, this place might be um, a target for a bit of changing in the future. Um, and I think my boss sort of realized that uh, during these uh, this first year, uh, which I had, uh, because I started to talk to my colleagues and wanted to. Uh, make them aware that we could change our own workplace if we wanted to and they said ah, good luck that will never happen uh, because it used to be like this and no nothing changes around here but <laughs> uh, I was really patient and um, we tried to uh, try to organize them uh, on a really um, low intense scale and um, I think my boss uh, realized that somehow because she thought I was a bit inconvenient. So, uh, in end May 2011, where, when I worked there for one year, um, she was uh, calling me into her office. And this is kind of strange because she never addresses me otherwise because she doesn't really talk to me. Uh, she talks to the other employees, uh, but not me. So I was a bit scared and I uh, took my colleague with me as a witness. And uh, at her office she told me that I will not be a target for... Um, I will not work there for um, anymore. Uh, I will be fired uh, after, um, after summer vacation. 
or before summer vacation. And I asked her for a reason, and she told me that, um, yeah, we're going to strengthen the German profile of the school. Um, and since you don't speak so well German, then you have to go, I'm sorry. Um, and I, later on I understood that this was a complete falsification, um, because, I can, yeah, she did, uh, she, this, this was a lie, and uh, I can tell you that later, actually. Uh, <laughs> this was a very special day. It was the 29th, 29th of May, and at that very day we had um, um, the Crown Princess of Sweden uh, visiting our school. So it was full of uh, secret, uh, uh, secret service persons and hundred policemen and it was super strange and she she was talking to me at 9 30 and i was supposed to stand on the stairs to school welcoming uh, the crown princess to school uh, with my first grade kids which which the cutest ones and uh, yeah one and a half hour before she told me that i got fired so it was kind of a bad timing i would say so then i was expected to stand there and be smiling and happy uh, I told my colleagues that I won't work anything anymore this day, so please cover for me. And then I went and uh, went into um, a classroom and I wrote a letter, uh, a letter addressed to the parents of the school. Uh, I conveniently had all their addresses. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, in the, in the next room, I heard the crown princess talk to the kids. I didn't see her, though. Um, but actually, here she is. Here she is standing in front of my class. Yeah, this is an article which was written a bit later on. Um, this letter, uh, my boss eventually found out that I was uh, writing. And she addressed me er later on that afternoon and told me that this uh, way of acting was unacceptable and that I was supposed to hand lend in my keys and leave the school premises. So I was uh, taken away from work like within uh, yeah within a, a two hours. And then I said to her, please let me join the meeting uh, where I'm where you're gonna tell the rest of the of my colleagues that I won't work here anymore because she hadn't addressed them yet. And then she said, this meeting is now cancelled, so please go home, everyone. Um, and actually she told me this in front of my all my colleagues that, sh that I should leave school premises and I'll and gave, give it my keys. So half an hour later, I packed up my stuff and we left and we went to a colleague's place and we talked about this. It was kind of a trauma. Um, yeah, because, we, I mean, I was really upset and I, I yelled and I said all nasty stuff and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was uh, quite dramatic. Uh, so we, we hung out there and, and uh, for like five hours. Talk, talk through how we, how we could act in the future. During these five hours, um, my, um, I had a contact with one of the parents, uh, which said to me that, what the fuck happened? Uh, we received a letter from your boss telling, telling us that you were fired. And then I said, what? Please send this letter to me. So she sent it to me. And in the letter it said that I had behaved, she didn't address me as my, in my name actually, she said I had um, behaved uh, unacceptable in front of the kids, the parents and the, my colleagues. And for that reason I wasn't, uh, I was fired on the spot and I, uh, and I wouldn't be working there anymore. Uh, and then we felt, the colleagues of mine, uh, that we would have to say something about this because this was a complete falsification. And it sounded a little bit like I had some, uh, I mean, uh, that, that I was abusing some kids or whatever. I, 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 it sounded really bad. 
And then we all wrote a letter together um, uh, saying that this letter wasn't, uh, there wasn't any truth in this and, uh, yeah, and that they should write to the principal and tell what they think about the situation. And all the teachers signed this, um, uh, this letter and uh, yeah, it felt really good. During this weekend, this was a Friday, um, during this weekend the kids started this Facebook group which was called We Who Wants Johnny Back at Work, which was really nice. It was almost like I died and you know, I, 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 I got to hear what they said at the funeral, you know. So it was, yeah, it, it was really, you know, uh, a lot of love in that. And the parents, they met on, on, on Sunday and talked through what they could do for, to get me back at work. And they talked about having, keeping their kids home from work, from school on Monday as a protest. But eventually they decided to uh, show up at school instead. So 17 parents showed up at school at 8.30 Monday morning when I, when I was home sleeping uh, and said we won't leave the school premises until Johnny's back. So they actually said, we will occupy the school if he, he won't come back. And yeah, it's a bit too good to be true, I would say. <laughs> and the CEO said, I won't show up. And the principal called in sick. So she wasn't there to, uh, to, to, um, to meet the parents. And uh, yeah, eventually they got the CEO to come to school anyways. And at 11 o'clock they phoned me and asked me to come in. And then I brought my... Oh, sorry. Back the... Back the <laughs> on, on this very uh, weekend I met with my Bildung section, the, the section in Fao, which I was a part of. Um, and we discussed also uh, all different kind of strategies that we could, uh, how, how we could put pressure on the school if I wouldn't be back at school. Yeah, I brought, I came there with my uh, lawyer, which Pav was paying for, and we had a two hour negotiation um, with two uh, parents, uh, representatives, um, two colleagues of mine. A psychologist was there as well, the CEO and my lawyer. And um, what we, oh, yeah, we decided that they apologized that they had gone too far. That it was some kind of overreaction, and um, but I had to apologize too that I had overreacted with writing this letter which I agreed on. So we wrote this letter together to all, address all the teachers, uh, all the parents, saying that uh, we overreacted and uh, we agree on uh, putting this uh, behind us and uh, we look for a bright future, la la la, um, all is good, John will be back at work on Tuesday. And on Tuesday I was back at school. And yeah, I was, the kids met me in, like came and hung me, came and hung me. And during this um, three weeks until summer break, I, my, the principal was calling sick. She never showed up again. And uh, I so, yeah, went to, on holiday with my red pioneer scarf on, on the final day of school. And uh, yeah, and in fall I was still working there. So, and I'm still, I still am. Um, eventually, this uh, principal, uh, she from 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 uh, being sick, she went on maternity leave, Mutterschutz, and she came back to school seventh the seventh of January this year. But um, during her uh, uh, absence, absence. We all, all teachers wrote a letter, a three pages long letter, telling how she was as a boss and how faults that she has been, uh, that she's done, 
and um, actually legal f- stuff that she she done that was completely wrong, and we all signed it, and all actually old par- old teachers also which has had worked at school before they also signed this, and we handed it in to the school board, and they couldn't obviously not ignore this document, so they fired her the seventh of January this year, so. Uh, instead of uh, yeah, and, and because of her lack of uh, leadership and lack of confidence, and I mean we couldn't we we had had been really scared of this seventh of January because we talked a lot about this, and we didn't want to work there if she came back. Um, so, but in the meantime, you also had uh, some contract negotiations as well. Huh? Um, Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's another story, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I can, I can. Well, it just that it shows that after this uh, whole scenario, that uh, there was a more of a confidence amongst the workers to. That's true. To um, yeah, better their condition. Mm-hmm. That's true. Before summer vacation, like this nine year. months back. Um, uh, we were offered a, a contract. Um, I mean, for the for, I've been working there for two years, and they handed a contract to all of us, saying, um, "Here's finally the contract is here, seven pages in German. Uh, please, uh, please sign it now." And then we all said, "Like, oh wait, can we please have a look at it at least?" So we said, okay, we'll sign it three days later. And then we, uh, we were reading it through and had it translated. And uh, we understood that it was a, a fucked up contract. A, the, the worst contract ever. And they wanted us to sign this. And then we came back to this meeting and they said, oh, please, this was three days before summer vacation. And we said, no, we won't sign it. And six... Out of us, we are, we are seven teachers. Six out of us said we won't sign it. So then they uh, actually pulled the contract back. So at the moment we don't have any contract, but with an oral contract instead, then with, which is like better than this fucked up one. So because of all this history of conflict and that we want stuff together, we actually acted together, uh, six out of seven at least. And since winning this um, this small conflict, maybe in the future we'll show that we are strong together and that we actually can change our workplace. And I don't think they want to fire me again because, um, yeah, then they... <laughs> I, they, they might don't they don't want to go through that again, I guess. Um, so I mean, this pamphlet, "How to Fire Your Boss," is quite a good example. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I read it afterwards, and it's, it's uh, we we use a lot of these tactics, and and and, uh, and I mean, my my colleagues are not radical or anything, you know, but we did stuff together, and we got rid of our dictator and now we have a new boss but she's better at least and that's the conflict here in Berlin I don't know if you have patience or time or lust to hear the Swedish one um, yeah I don't know <laughs> should, I t- should I take the Swedish one as well? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this actually happened right before I moved to Berlin uh, so uh, if my mm, uh, my <laughs> bosses, the, my bosses today would have go- googled me before they hired me. They wouldn't have hired me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's why. Yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I, in Sweden you have to know this because um, as as um, I, I was a member of the SAC, which is the syndicalist organization in Sweden. And um, as a union in Sweden, you are uh, allowed to negotiate at your workplace. And if you ask for a negotiation, it has to be held within a short notice, within two weeks. So 
um, I was asking for a negotiation about my salary in April and I got no reply from my boss and then I asked for it again no reply and then I felt okay let's do this um, and then you're actually able to sue your um, your boss for uh, for um, uh, how, how do you say that? Uh, for not taking on the negotiation yeah. yeah and they said oh no 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 you're not a real union it's it's this is not this is not the you, you're not gonna win this and then I you have no you have no evidence of this uh, but I mean I had my emails that I've been writing you know and, and asking for this negotiation and uh, this was in summer of 2010 and uh, the, the school didn't want to take the conflict so they gave it to the lawyers of the city in Malmö uh, in south, southern Sweden so we were sitting there with the, with the lawyers of the city of Malmö and our uh, building was sexy in, in, uh, in Malmö and uh, we had with this is like just a copy but we made a big poster uh, A3 poster with my letter which I was writing to my boss asking for the negotiation this is a print screen and um, I say hello Leon uh, because I'm negotiating for myself as being a syndicalist I would like to have a negotiation about my salary I can do it Wednesday and Thursday afternoon this week regards Johnny and uh, then there is a, a, a text here about um, labor rights and how you are actually a, uh, you are allowed to have this negotiation and that they have break this rule uh, they have broken this rule and and then we have the name of my boss the name of his boss and this name of uh, the, the top guy in Malmö and their names and their phone numbers and emails run right to these persons and tell what you think about um, the school breaking against these rules and then we said we will put this up in the whole area which this, where this school is uh, on every uh, what, what do you call these uh, electric uh, every box yeah, or whatever box. yeah uh, <laughs> see yeah and uh, yeah, we showed them that, and then we took this one as well, like, and we will give uh, one of these copies to every household in the in the area, telling you, uh, telling them what you've been doing. And then they said, "Can we please take a five minute break?" And then they took a five minute break, and then they came back <laughs> and said, "Okay, what do you want?" <laughs> <laughs> and then we had two IDs for them. We said, um, either you give us um, 3,500 euros and we're fine. Or you give us 2,500 euros, you write a really good recommendation letter for me, you apologize in front of the staff of the school and um, you record it and you play this you, so you can play it um, so I can hear it because I wouldn't have, wouldn't be there because I moved to Berlin and then they chose the, the, the cheaper version which was maybe more fun for us actually because then they then, then uh, the, the, this, this person he phoned me and he played this into this thing <laughs> where they like read from the script like uh, we have been uh, rejecting this negotiation la 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 and uh, we are po apologize to to uh, the member Johnny la 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 and uh, we paid them two thousand five hundred euros for uh, not doing this and and I mean this is not any this is like a, a normal amount of money for for this 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 kind of stuff. And then half of the money should go to the, the union office and half of the money should go to my pocket. And since this was a communal school, I didn't feel like taking the money from this communal school and putting it in my pocket. So we actually did a thing with uh, an organization in this area, um, which was working with kids in the area. And then, of course, we...
called all the press, and then we were handing over the money, and <laughs> we got three articles from this action uh, of uh, winning the conflict and giving away the money. So, I mean, uh, it was super successful. And this happened right before I moved to Berlin. And this is just another example how you can use direct action to win your conflicts. There is no... Okay, there's legal limits. <laughs> but you can be really... You know, if you just have fantasy, you can, you can do a lot of things. But, yeah. Actually, I think it's, more, it's possible to do more stuff in, in Sweden than here, but... <laughs> Yeah, always a chance of trying. You know? One of the problems here in Germany is that the laws relating to unions and the action we can take are, have been in place since the late 1930s. So if you think about what was going on in Germany in the late 1930s, then you get a good idea of what these laws are like. So basically, you're fucked. It's very restrictive. This uh, union got its union status taken away a couple of years ago because of a conflict that happened just around the corner at the Babylon Cinemas, um, where members of the organisation were negotiating for better conditions and better pay. Um, and the union called for a boycott of the cinema when the owners of the cinema failed to respond to this request. The biggest union in Germany, Verdi, stepped in and told the owners of the cinema that we were acting illegally and that they could uh, actually sue us and get our union status revoked, which they did. And we were the first union to be banned in Germany since Hitler. So it was a big deal, but um, it kind of shows you how difficult it is. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are... Uh, very small is because we're forced a lot of the time to I mean we can't it's very difficult for us to call a strike or to go for a boycott or pickets so we're forced to be very creative in what we do and uh, that's good in a way because we've developed a way of putting a lot of pressure on people uh, on, on bosses um, without using the traditional methods of, of the union but yeah, the more we grow, the bigger we, uh, or the more possibility we have of, of uh, using these kind of traditional methods like strikes and boycotts and things like that. We have to be careful, that's the only thing. But that was one thing that Johnny, you said there about uh, direct action that I had completely forgotten about when I talked about union strength, and that is the fact that we, you know, that's one of the underlying principles of anarcho syndicalism and this union is that we don't wait around for mediation or for uh, necessarily for uh, for solutions from somewhere else we go to the heart of the to the center of the problem and we take action we take back our you know the decisions over our own lives which is good <laughs> It's very good. Is there any questions in the room, perhaps? Can be huge ones or detailed questions, anything. <laughs> I guess we'll thank you for listening. You can hang around here if you like. You can sign the uh, email list to get um, more info from our section. And I don't know if everyone here, I know that you're not uh, here for, you're, you're German, but we are the foreigner section and we are uh, members from 15 different countries at the moment. And uh, at the moment we, we've done this um, folder with labor rights in Germany, which is uh, in English, and uh, online there is 12 um, versions in different languages. Yeah. So. This, is, this has been very good. It's very. Uh, <laughs> we have just this week we had an issue with uh, this the point in here, the first point, which is about dismissal. So when you get fired, and uh, somebody came to us this week and said uh, he had showed up to work on Monday and got told he had no more job. So he just came to work like any other normal day, and they said, "No, you go home. This is the new guy. He's got your job now." 
So um, he came to us, and of course, this is a classic thing that the bosses do. They try and get away with everything, and they, you know, of course I can do that. It's my work. I own this workplace. But of course I can tell you to go home. But he can't, and um, even though this person had only been working there for a month, he still had his rights, and he had the right to be informed of why he was being fired and that he was being fired two weeks before he loses his job, and he needs to get it in writing. So we went, me and Johnny, with him to his workplace. We talked with the manager. She wasn't very happy. She uh, rang the big, big boss, the big boss man, the big boss man talked with me on the phone. He asked us to leave the place. He said, you know, he's in the right, legally he's right, that we should get our lawyer if we think that, uh, if we want to continue with this situation. But he had, uh, he said, uh, yeah, leave. Don't, you're ruining my business. I said, well, you are going to have a lot more trouble. It's a very small problem. You can sort it out now or you can start the shitstorm and uh, he said okay we'll see and so we came back we organised dates with the lawyer we started to organise how we were going to campaign around this thing started to get ideas together and uh, then and to be honest we felt really confident in this because we like one week back, we won the exact same case, and we went to the same lawyer. Yeah. So I mean, we felt really confident in this. But but then uh, yesterday evening, <laughs> the person got a uh, knock on his door. Uh, he wasn't expecting anybody to come round. He opened the door, and there was the big boss man. And he said, "Oh, what are you doing here?" And he said, "Well, I came to say sorry. Uh, you can have your job back." I still have to let you go because I can't give you. Uh, 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 we had to let you go, so um, the, the person said that's okay. I had no problem with losing my job. It was the way it was done. And he said, "Well, we we'll give you your job back until the end of March. Here's all your papers that you needed. They were also this was another problem. They were withholding papers from him, which was a big was a big mess for the person because they couldn't go to the airport stamp. They couldn't do all these things they needed to do." And magically, he had all the papers suddenly, which he had been telling everybody that no, I don't. You know, he'd been telling the per the person who came to us, oh, I don't have the papers. They'll be there next week. I'm waiting on this. Blah blah blah. All the papers were magically there, and he had his job back, at least until the end of March. And he got paid for those days that it didn't work. That he was su supposed to work. So this is the thing. They love bullying people. And they love bullying people on these little small points. And they love bullying foreigners who yeah. don't know their rights or don't have any network. And that network, we can be. Because we, have, we are in the same situation and we've been through this. I mean, I... Yeah, yeah certainly. Yeah.